Welcome back. If you haven't seen my videos before, I'm Ross the Oliver Man. And today we're going to do something not Oliver related, but some of the techniques used in this, I guess, you can apply to Oliver stuff. And we are going to be working on this early 1900s Massey Harris hit and miss gas engine. And uh, I guess it's, I shouldn't call it a hit and miss, it's technically a throttle governed engine. People always call these flywheel type engines hit and miss, but they're not all hit and miss. Hit and miss refers to the type of governor system where it only fires whenever it needs uh, to pick up speed. The governor more or less holds an exhaust valve open and lets it coast until that time. And this particular engine actually uses a flyball governor and a carburetor overflow type carburetor with a fuel pump and so uh, it as it needs the governor adjusts this butterfly on the carburetor so this is a throttle governed engine and not a hit and miss but anyway this is on my show trailer and I've been meaning to get this done so that I could put this back in the shed but at the fair it started leaking water really badly and what it amounted to is it had frozen best over the winter since I hadn't used it for two years during the shutdown of the world in 2020. I had drained the water out, but apparently the way that this is cast, it was just enough that it was letting some rest in there or maybe the thing was pointed downhill and some water settled in there and it was just enough to bust that out. So we had it brazed up and then uh, I drilled and tapped it here. I actually let them do it while they were brazing it, but had it tapped for eighth inch pipe thread so we can put a drain right in the head so that it will for sure not do this again. You can see the other drain is right here, right behind the head. You would think that that would get it all, but I guess depending on the angle that it was sitting, it may not let all the water out. So now it will for sure, but one thing we have to do is we need to make ourselves a new head gasket because this one isn't very good and it's not very thick. So I'm going to show you how to make a gasket using gasket material and uh, hopefully I can get this all put back together and uh, then it'll be ready for this next year. Okay, so we're going to work inside here and this like everything else of mine piled full of stuff so we need to clean first there's axle seals for the 1650 but we'll get us a spot here this is actually my rollaway box that i had when i worked in the shop okay i think we got some room now to work with so we've got a piece of gasket material and I actually started making one of these the other day and then I thought maybe it'd be something that people would like to see how to make gaskets. So most of the Oliver gaskets are available but there is occasions when you might have to make your own. So basically I'm going to start with the head in this case and I'm going to try to put it right on the edges where I'm not wasting very much material. And this is going to be kind of uh, tricky maybe because the valves actually protrude down and they don't let it sit totally flush. So I need to give a little bit extra so that we don't have not enough. So we'll start by tracing and then we'll start uh, marking out some holes. So we have our first uh, circle there and it would be easier to cut it out to work with and for that we have several choices of things we could use. 
Uh, of course, you can always use your utility knife, whatever. I like these scissors that I got from the Hobo Freight. They're pretty handy. I've got multiple pairs of them, and they seem to work great for jobs like this. So that's what we'll go ahead and use. All right, so now we've got our basic circle and we can kind of compare the old gasket to it just to make sure, but I don't like to make gaskets off of a gasket. I like to make them off of the head if possible. And the old one you can tell was rough cut probably with a knife because it's not even on all the sides. But what I want to do with it is I'm gonna use it to kind of trace the inner circle and cut it out because we can be close with that. We don't have to go to the edge if you're afraid of not having enough material. But as long as we're inside all of the edges, I think we should be fine with the inside circle. So we'll give that a try and see what happens. And I always like to keep a slab of wood on top of the rollaway box so that you don't dull up your cutting tools when you're using them. The uh, top of this box I made, I made this top when I got the box and this is actually a piece of quarter inch thick steel, plate steel. And then I welded this 3 8 round rod around the edge and uh, ground it smooth on the outside and cut it in such a way that it fit inside of the corners here. And that makes it a really nice work surface. You can buy these boxes with the top, but uh, I like this better actually than the factory top. It's a lot more solid, I think. And then I got my vise mounted right in the corner. So the nice thing about this is you got this lip so stuff doesn't roll off. This was an idea that was concocted many years ago by the guys that worked at the dealer I worked at. And they had made one of these on all of their boxes. So. I followed suit and made one on this one. But anyway, we got our slab of wood. We'll use the utility knife to get this uh, cut out and then we'll lay it on the head and start making our water outlet marks. I'm just going to do a rough cut first and then go back and get closer to that line. I might even be able to use the scissors, which are easier to control. It's really not any fun when you get almost done and then you destroy it and have to start all over. So. We should be about through. You can see the outline from the back side. We'll get our handy scissors out again and see if we can get in here and get closer to that line now. There we go. Now our big thing is going to be marking the passages for the water. And on this one actually even though the head has four water passages, we actually don't use this one because on the block it's solid. So there's no reason to cut this hole. 
So all we need is our four bolt holes and then these three water passages. And so there's several ways you could go about this. Uh, you know, you can put grease or something on here and lay it on and make marks. You can uh, take your hammer and try to give it a few whacks around and get the indents made. But I'm going to compare this old gasket and see it's pretty pretty well what we want you can tell that there it wasn't quite enough and there it wasn't quite enough so i'm thinking that if we trace this basic shape and make a few changes we'll be in business we can always uh modify it a little bit later at the end but that's what we're gonna do I know I said I don't like to use the old gaskets to make new gaskets, but to get the basic outline, I'm fine with it. We know this other one was on there. What I'm mainly worried when cutting new ones is about the outside and inside edge that you got enough meat and you don't, uh, you know, cut yourself short. See, like this one. I think I'm going to change the pattern because it looks a little bit thin on the outside. So we can go a little bit different. So now we got our basic outline and I think I'm going to start with the four bolt holes. And what we're going to use to do this is we're going to use a gasket punch set and I'm sure you can find these in different brands this one's a snap-on I like it works good we had one at the shop too it was good and what we need to do is find the size of our uh, studs and I'm pretty sure that they are half inch studs I'm actually going to use the 9 16 uh, cutter just to give myself a little bit of room in case I don't hit it quite right but you need a piece of wood under here for this or you'll destroy these things and then just take it on there and punch it through I need to get my better hammer this little tiny hammer isn't gonna do it yes I have a second snap-on bearing remover in here so like I said in the other videos, those are good things. So there you can see it makes a nice clean hole. So we'll just repeat that process for these other ones. And then we'll go on to cutting the water outlets. Two. So we got that done. Now we're going to clean out our bit from the old gasket material. There we go. Just let it fly. That's fine. Now to cut our water outlet passages, you can just start carving or whatever. But I'm actually going to take one of these and I'm going to cut the two radius ends on each one and then connect them with the utility knife. I think that'll make a nicer gasket when we're done.
There we go. We'll put our tools away, but I guess I should have showed you what it looked like inside. But you get all these different sized dies, and then the driver part that just has an O-ring on the end and clips right into them. Makes it pretty handy. So now we need to cut the piece between the two holes to form our water jacket area. And this doesn't have to be perfectly precise for these old engines. They just work off of basically convection. I mean, the water, it doesn't circulate. It just sits in the hopper. So as long as water can pass through and get to the head, that's all you're after. So we'll work on this. And I think I might even be able to use my scissors for this too, which is good because it works a lot simpler than... That utility knife as far as controlling it. I don't know if I can cut it in such a way that I can show you what I'm doing on camera because that's kind of a weird angle. There we go. That's not too bad. Not quite maybe but It'll work. Probably would also work if I didn't have these gloves on, but it's starting to get really cold and I can't feel my fingers, so I guess I'll do it with gloves on. Here we go. I'll trim that one up a little bit. I think we'll call that good. We'll now lay it on there and make sure that we got something that's going to work. <clears throat> that we didn't screw this up royally, which has happened before. So if we put that on there, it looks like we have all four of our bolt holes. We have our three water passages and we still have enough meat to seal on the head. So I think we will be in business. I will probably use a little bit of number two Permatex on this just because a thin film of that, that stuff seems to seal up leaks better than just regular silicone. And might even over here polish up some valves, but I think the head was in pretty good shape. It wasn't, uh, the only thing wrong was it busted that piece out. So if you're not really sure how these work, it's basically just like a regular engine. You've got your intake valve up here and your exhaust valve down here. And as it runs, the difference is that people don't seem to always understand is you don't have a uh, rocker arm on your intake valve. As the piston goes back, it just sucks this in and it gets a breath of fuel and then it goes on its way. And then your rocker arm is only on your exhaust valve and it just keeps pushing and opens that up and there you have it. So that's how those work. They're really not as confusing as they seem. So we will get this put back on now and hopefully this will be a runner again by the next time we wanna take it out this spring or summer. I actually decided before I put it back on I gave it a few swipes with the file just to make sure we had a level surface come at it from different ways and make sure it lays flat across this and then you know because our brazed up area I didn't know if it felt like it was a little bit proud of the head but I think it's good enough now that 
any imperfections will be sealed by our gasket and that little bit of Permatex. Boy, is their ass tired. So, now we're going to put a little bit of silicone on this. Not really silicone, number two Permatex. Which is good stuff if you don't want things to leak. As long as you let it sit for about 24 hours, it seems like it does a good job of uh, keeping things sealed. All right. So we're gonna lay that on there. And I'm gonna put a little bit on the block the same way I did. I had cleaned this up the other day, so it still looks good. Good enough for who it's for. You have to remember, these are not high compression engines, and they're not at the shows being used for anything other than just idling, so you can get by with a lot uh, less precision, I guess you'd say. But it's nice to have them ready if you want to build them up to something. So what I've tried to do on my trailer is make a display where everything's doing something, but sometimes that's not uh, possible. This engine just sits here and looks pretty. There we go. That'll work great. Now I'll put this on. All right. So, whoever had this before me as well also made very nice stainless steel nuts for it. So, made it a show piece. So that's kind of nice. I'm going to try to keep those clean. And, I need to make sure we do this in the right order because I need to put, I think, just the rocker bracket on. I don't think I have to put the carburetor on first. Uh, but this definitely has to be on there first. It's been a while since I took it apart. The cap, they made, they, he made this cap to push on the fuel pump lever. I remember now. Now, in case you're wondering... The torque spec on these, you need to use the German torque wrench and guten tight. So that's what we'll do. Just don't go wild and snap them off, but as long as they're tight, like I said before, these are not as precision uh, as modern engines, so you don't have to be quite the same with these as you do something newer. They're not running under a bunch of boost or anything like that so but do try to tighten them evenly first and then just go around another nice thing is most of these you can fix with just basic tools like an adjustable wrench and a screwdriver and that's the kind of stuff i carry with me on this trailer because at the show you might need to do a repair so you can accomplish it with just basic stuff. That one.
Well, I think we're where we need to be. We can always redo it in the summer, I guess, if it fails. But we'll go ahead and put this carburetor back on and try to get it all buttoned up so there's not pieces strewn about. Well, it looks like we got about everything. We need to hook up the fuel lines again. Basically, you've got, since you've got an overflow carburetor, you've got one feed line, and then this is your return line. So whatever it doesn't use goes back to be used again. We'll put them in. And then I think it's ready to go. Well, if it was warmer, I'd start it up and let you hear it run, but when it's cold like this, they're really cantankerous and everything's so stiff, the grease and the oil, because in the summertime, I use the heavy, heavy stuff because of a lot of them are kind of wore out. So guys usually use the thickest oil they can get in there and it lasts longer. So you don't have to keep be putting oil in it all night long. Usually what I use is like a, 40 or 50 weight oil and some Lucas oil and that kind of stuff and mix it together and it'll hang in there all night on the gears and everything and keeps them running smooth but anyway so if you're not sure how these work like I said your gas is down there in the tank underneath and it sucks up in this case it's a got a fuel pump in it right here and how it works is as the uh push rod comes back and forth it also drives this pump there look at that it's even drawn fuel from the tank so of course it doesn't do it that fast because as it runs it pushes up on this that pumps fuel so the fuel goes in this overflow carburetor you set your uh, fuel mixture here and this is actually the amount that you let drain back into the tank how fast you want that to happen And then as it goes around, atmospheric pressure sucks in the intake valve, gets the slug of the fuel, goes around again. And then as it comes up on top dead center, it trips this igniter, which you can see, it'll come around. And when it trips the igniter, that's when it fires. And then it sends the motor off and does it all over again. The igniter uh, is basically like a set of breaker points it made a lot bigger than what you see in your distributor and that's what makes the fire to run this some of the engines later on had spark plugs but the igniter is a pretty simple setup as long as you have a uh, you know good hot battery to run it with and then as it comes around after firing of course it pushes on this and opens the exhaust valve and then it lets the exhaust gas out and then continues on your way so very simple setup a lot of people always ask what's in the hopper that's water that's how it cools it 
it's totally surrounded by water there you see the casting where the uh, bore is and then it's surrounded completely by water and that's what keeps it cool the fly ball governor there's your cam gear that with the eccentric that runs your push rod and then everything is manually greased with grease cups you just turn them till grease squirts out i don't know if there's enough left in there or not but there you can hear it coming but i think i need more about out your piston is lubricated by this drip oiler you set the amount you want it to go and it drips down this tube a little at a time there's a hole in the top of the piston it'll fall through the hole and it runs down the rod and then it also whatever's left drips into the piston pin and that's how everything gets lubricated this actually even though it is a massey harris and it's badged it says massey harris on it it's actually a worthington built engine i don't know if i said that or not but uh they look identical if you saw them side by side but they made them for massey harris there was another uh run of massey harris engines later on that were red this really is supposed to be blue in this early day and then later on they were red and those are the ones you see more often like the type one and the type two but these were before that time and uh anyway just something different i don't know if you guys like that or not if you do say something in the comments we can do more old stuff uh like this but, but it's up to you so again thank you for watching and i'll see you in the next one